welcome all of you here today. Um, it's wonderful to see so many faces uh, bright and early on a Friday morning when it's beautiful outside. So thanks for, thanks for f uh, following through on your desire to be here. Um, my name is Bonnie Jenkins, and I am a non-resident senior fellow here at the Brooking Institution. I'm also the founder and president of the Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, or WCAPS, as you can see from up here. Um, I want to thank the Brookings uh, Foreign Policy Program and the Brookings Communications staff for co-hosting this event with WCAPS. I want to especially thank Bruce Jones and Tamara Wittes, who have been such great collaborators for this program. I also want to thank all of the moderators and panelists for agreeing to be part of this morning's discussion. WCAPS was founded just last year with the goal to advance the leadership and professional development of women of color in the fields of peace, security, and conflict transformation. WCAPS believes that global issues demand a variety of perspectives, so the organization is cultivating a strong voice and network for its members while encouraging dialogue and strategies for engaging in policy discussions on an international scale. The organization is also committed to advancing the leadership and professional development of women of color. Right now, there is no significant or sustained voice from women of color who are often the most affected by issues of peace and security and who are also community leaders in many parts of the world. WCAPS works to fill that gap. In looking at the landscape of issues that concern women of color in the peace and security space, one that came into clear focus is how we, the US, define our national security. Now, why is this a concern? It is because how the U.S. views its national security and then determines how it will address what it defines our security threats will directly impact not just Americans here in the U.S., but people abroad. WCAS became interested in how our national security strategy affects women of color here and around the world. The organization came to this issue with a national security lens that is, cult that is colored by consensus and concer concerns that are not just countries that are adversaries to the U.S. and how the military will address those adversaries. WCAPS considers what are the quote-unquote non-traditional threats that are becoming more significant and both are and will increasingly impact the security of Americans, such as climate change, infectious disease, food and water, water security, and others. In preparation for this discussion, I reviewed some definitions of national security. There are several. One such definition of national security is, quote, the prote protection of a nation from attack or other danger by holding adequate armed forces and guarding state secrets, unquote, which is what we would anticipate as a traditional definition. However, the definition goes on to say, quote, the term national security encompasses within it economic security, monetary security, energy security, environmental security, military security, political security, and security of energy and natural resources, end quote. Another definition states simply that national security is, quote, a collective term for the defense and foreign relations of a country and protection of the interests of a country, end quote. In my perspective, the first more expansive definition is more accurate today in light of the threats that we face, threats that come from many different sources and not from one or two specific adversaries. The strategy for national security can have a focus on traditional threats. However, the strategy should increasingly acknowledge other threats to the United States. The 2017 U.S. national security strategy has a significant focus on Russia and China. The theme of dealing with Russia and China as adversary pops, adversaries pops up repeatedly in the document. While I won't want to debate the merits of how much of the national security strategy should be focused on Russia and China, it did leave me with a bit of a Cold War feel. The recent U.S. national security strategy did not did note other issues that are a source of threats to you Americans. However, the degree to which these issues are focused on is minimal. By so giving these issues little attention, we miss an opportunity to find a way to address these issues head on. As a case in point, I counted how often certain terms are used in a document. The word military uh, appears approximately 75 times or more. Water security, approximately one or less. 
disease approximately four times, food security approximately one time, and biodiversity approximately one. What we must understand is that national security is not just national. Working to ensure our security is good, but is not sufficient to ensure we are protected. The actions we take as a result of our strategy should be more reflective of a 2018 world. Let's look at what is happening today. We are facing another outbreak of Ebola right now in the Congo. Already one person has died and at least another 11 cases are detected. There is a global program dedicated to this effort called the Global Health Security Agenda with over 60 countries all working to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. However, U.S. programs and personnel who are critical to this U.S. and global effort are facing massive cuts to the program. Do we have a true understanding of how infectious disease challenges our national security if we cut programs to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease? Or should we assume that these other areas of threats to our health and environment, which make us all more vulnerable, can largely, largely take care of themselves? And what about climate change? Are we adequately addressing that threat to U.S. citizens, and are our actions here and abroad helping to address this threat? The definition of national security has been used in various ways, and often administrations see fit when it desires to take an action to further its goals. Doing this has been true for both parties when in power. When the recent issue of tariffs on steel was a topic of discussion, there was a focus on steel being an issue of national security. Does that make sense? However, one must also keep in mind that not everyone wants to have his or her substantive area of work viewed through a security lens. There is a concern that security issues may somehow quote unquote hijack these issues, such as food and water security or migration or infectious disease, and bring into these discussions a focus that they do not believe is particularly helpful. In fact, they may feel that a security lens is even a threat to the work that they do and to the lives of the people who carry out the work. So how do we find a definition that includes more non-traditional issues that directly affect Americans while at the same time respects the concerns of those who work in the field. Also, should we ask if the current definitions are adequate or, and we just have not gotten it right, or do we need a new one? We must also look at it in terms of who's at the table when we are defining our national security. Is the input into the development of the definition reflective of more non-traditional issues and various perspectives and people who have those perspectives? I look forward to this morning's discussion that will address some of these concerns. The first panel will get at some of these more strategic questions about how do we define national security and whether we need to redefine it. The second panel will drill down a bit and focus on how some of these quote unquote non-traditional security issues affect the security of not just Americans but people around the world and also how these issues are impacted by the definition. With that, I'd like to welcome to the, uh, to the floor here our first distinguished panel. I'd like to first introduce Mr. Michael O'Hanlon, who is a senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution, where he specializes in U.S. defense strategy, the use of military force, and American national security policy. I'd also like to welcome Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley, Who's, a ret who's retired as an ambassador after 30 plus years in the Foreign Service. I'd like to also introduce Heather Holbert, who is a director of the New Models of Policy Change Project at New America's Political Reform Program. And Ms. Sanam Nanagi Andolini, I hope I said that correctly, <laughs> who for over two decades has been a leading international peace strategist and in 2000, she was among the civil society drafters of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. I'd like to welcome all of our distinguished panelists to the floor.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike O'Hanlon, and I'm privileged to be part of this amazing discussion with these amazing women today. I want to thank Tamara Wittes and Bonnie Jenkins for inviting me to be part of a remarkable discussion, and thanks to all of you for being here on this lovely Friday morning. I'm going to turn to our panelists in just a second with really the big question of how should we think about redefining national security, but just a couple of words first. Uh, the main thing I want to say is I want to encourage all of them to be as autobiographical as possible in answering their questions if they so choose. We can make this very theoretical and Brookings-like, but <laughs> we can also make it uh, a little bit more exciting by hearing about some of the amazing work these people are, are doing and have done in their lives, often in the field, but certainly in ways that affect policy in, in very important ways. And I want to hear those stories, and I'm sure you do too. So I hope that we'll interpose uh, autobiographical accounts with more conceptual discussions. I also want to just say one more word of broad framing, which is that as I ask each of the panelists to begin our conversation by giving an initial answer about how to redefine national security, how they would recommend that we do so, I'm very open to this discussion and I agree with this discussion. My own personal involvement at Brookings is often on sort of the Chinas and the Russias of, and the defense budgets of the world, but I was a Peace Corps volunteer and former uh, Zaire, the DRC, and one of, my, one, one of the next panelists actually is from the same city where I was a volunteer. We certainly, uh, uh, as well as everybody else here, think about how to uh, view problems of refugee flows. Beth Ferris is here as well to talk about that. Climate change, problems that were not as serious perhaps at earlier stages in history and have become more serious and could be threatening even to the territorial integrity and classic definition of national security of various states. So that's a part of the conversation uh, that I certainly hope we'll hear about. But I also want to push the panelists uh, and just invite them to respond in the following terms that if we make the definition of national security too broad, then we start to make the words less meaningful perhaps because we start to capture everything under a common frame. And so what I want to propose is a little bit of a taxonomy, three different categories of security. There's national security of the classic type, Russia and China attacking us or we attacking them or what have you. There are these new threats like climate change that could affect an entire country, you know, take away all of its territory if it's an island state, for example, or lead to such massive refugee flows that countries vary cohesion is threatened. So that's a second category where national security in a fairly traditional sense could be affected by new threats or growing threats. And then the third category is human security, which I think in some cases may be a better term to describe some of the issues that we're talking about today than national security. And I'm just going to finish here by noting one thing I learned uh, last year in a study with General Ray Odierno. And we looked at urban security around the world and benefited from the research of a lot of other people and visited a lot of cities in Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, and the United States. And one thing I saw in that study was that if you, you know, there's a lot of preoccupation with terrorism in the American national security debate, but if you look globally at the deaths per year from all terrorism combined, it's way too high, but it's a lot less than certain other categories of violence. So 30,000 or so deaths per year, even in the broadest definition of terrorist-related violence, you know, civil wars in the broader Middle East, for example, that involve elements of terrorism. There are 100,000 people a year who die from war broadly defined, but there are almost half a million who die a year from homicide. And that's often more of a question of human security or urban security or local security than it is of national security. And I just want to press our panelists to explain from their point of view just how far we should expand this definition of national security and where it becomes counterproductive or it's better to talk more in terms of human security. So with that long introduction, I appreciate your patience. I just wanted to frame the discussion that way. And then we'll just work down the row here, starting with Heather. And so please uh, offer your own definition or your own thoughts on how we should reconceptualize national security. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Great. Um, thank you, Michael. And I really want to congratulate both WCAPS and, and Brookings as a, a staffer at a sister think tank here in town. Um, this is clearly a secret formula to get A, a full room on a Friday morning, <laughs> and B, that holy grail, lots of younger event attendees. So um, clearly planners should be paying attention to this formula because this is the kind of room that every think tank in town would kill 
to get at an event. So, um, so now, now, we have to, now we have to live up to that. Um, so you asked for us to be autobiographical, Mike, and it's, um, I've gotten to the point in my career that I feel like this is the beginning of the third wave of how should we redefine national security that I've lived through, um, which really speaks to um, both, I think, what a turbulent, um, what a turbulent time. Um, we all had the good fortune, good fortune, remind ourselves of that when we get up every morning to, to have our careers in. Um, but also it should be cautionary about some of the things that haven't worked about previous efforts to redefine national security. And um, I would say the first one, of course, is that um, I finished my undergrad in 1989 and so came into the workforce where many of the core tenets of national security that I had been laboriously taught as an undergrad were suddenly in question um, and got to watch how we responded to that or failed to respond to that both as national security professionals and as a society. Um, and the second one, which I think Sanam will be able to talk to much more because I think that's where you made your career, was the effort in the 90s and 2000s to redefine security globally under a human security frame. Um, and that, I'll say, just to be a little controversial right at the beginning, had enormous success in a global context, and it was a complete failure in the American context. <laughs> and um, so as we start to think about this again, I would, I, I would and I, I think we now also have to say, if we're honest among ourselves, among friends, that what we as the national security community did to redefine national security after the end of the Cold War has not been the, the unblemished success that many of us wish that it were. So maybe um, as we have another go, if, you know, I'm lucky enough to be in the field still and get a third go at this, um, we want to think about that. And the point that I want to bring to this discussion is that, that we have failed to recognize that this is happening at two levels. And one level is the one that we participate in every day as think tank people, as academics, as op-ed writers, as national security professionals. And that's where we sort of think in terms of the kind of taxonomy that you put forward, um, which I think is good and fair. But we have consistently not thought about, and actually maybe over time gotten less and less connected to, uh, the way that, that national security is a political construct that is defined by politics in the United States, and it is defined by interest groups in the United States, and it is defined by the mass public insofar as it is represented through interest groups, and insofar as those interest groups make security issues one of their priorities. And that, I think, is the structure that we can use to think a little bit about um, how we would do things differently this time. Because I would argue that over the last five to 10 years, actually, national security has been redefined out from under the feet of the professionals. Um, and that national security has been, over the course of my career, been redefined into something that is much more military in focus uh, than it was when I was a young person um, coming to intern events at Brookings on my lunch hour. Um, and the const that construct has become much more narrowed at the same time as the security anxieties of the public, which can be fit into those three buckets that you talked about, many of them have been redirected toward military tools so that people who have anxieties, which are the anxieties of being a human being in industrial and in post-industrial times, uh, which are anxieties that get reflected in economic terms, they get reflected in terms of gender conflict, they get reflected in terms of cultural and racial conflict, um, and they get reflected in terms of, of terrorism and military conflict. Those, in many cases, are now being steered into the idea that those are things that our security apparatus can fix. Um, and so that's, and if you look at, if you look at polling data, there's a really significant swath of, of our electorate that draws a seamless line from ISIS to things that they are uncomfortable with or insecure about in their own communities. And um, as, as highly educated, highly analytical national security professionals, we may find that intensely frustrating, but it is a reality that we have to figure out how to deal with. Um, at the same time, we have the phenomenon that the many folks who have been working very hard um, to say, insert climate change 
into the national security construct, and who, by the way, have had great success in convincing the folks who do our military planning, the folks who do our intelligence planning, they don't need to be convinced that the climate is a security issue. You know, we've, we've, that battle is won. Um, but where the battle's not won is that even political forces that recognize climate to be, to be an important priority don't see it as fitting in the political construct that is national security, which we use to deal with a sort of specific set of, of psychic anxieties. So um, as we think about how do we as policy professionals make those definitions, um, I would urge that we also think about how we, how we connect our best understandings of what's really going on in the world, which you'll hear a lot about um, on our second panel this morning, ways that that connects back to political forces that are active in America now. And I would maybe close by pointing out that um, that's not as hard as you think. Um, and that what's actually really interesting is that a number of political movements on both the right and the left, some that would consider themselves highly partisan and political, others that wouldn't at all, um, really do have sort of core takes on core national security issues. Um, and we in our community are not only not used to thinking about them, but we're actively used to filtering them out and pushing them away. And um, as much as sometimes that's nice, uh, I would argue that it's been quite counterproductive to our ability to develop and use um, coherent models. And um, a co one example I'll give um, goes back to the 70s, actually, and that is it's in the 70s that the evangelical movement um, decides to get engaged in foreign policy and comes to it from a human rights perspective and then very effectively connects that human rights perspective to the security perspective of the time, which was anti-communism. Uh, and there's a wonderful book being written on this out of Trinity University. The author's name, I believe, is Lauren Fishman. Um, Forgive me, Lauren, if I didn't get your last name quite right, but I really, just thinking about how this process of different ways, Bonnie, to your point, of securitizing issues is really something we've been seeing for, for four decades now. Um, a totally different um, ideological point is, um, how many people have read the Movement for Black Lives Policy Manifesto? Okay, Movement for Black Lives has a foreign policy platform. It has a national security perspective. It is one that might be quite unfamiliar to many people in this room, okay. but um, us as security professionals, we've, we've got to understand the various currents that are going to be shaping, they're going to be shaping the realm of the possible for us. So I will, I will leave it there in my initial remarks. Thank you very much. And Gina, over to you, please. Okay. Well, I agree with much of what you said, so. Um, <laughs> I went back 30 years looking at our national security strategies, which covered my 30-year career of uh, the work that I do, the work that I did abroad being shaped by that strategy. And certainly in that 30 years, military security, economic security were the predominant themes throughout. But one year, part of the national security strategy was increasing uh, respect for citizenship in this country. There are at times addressing climate change. There are at times touching on food security. So the national security strategy isn't the same every year. Clearly the politics, as Heather said, and uh, interest groups have an impact on what goes into it. My position of this, because my work was dependent upon what that national security strategy was, is who are the people in the room making the decision about what's in that definition? And my position, having been doing this for 30 years, is that we don't have the right people in the room making this decision. That we have a small group of fairly homogeneous people making decisions that, in reality, have an impact on everyone in the world. That it's, I don't believe that is an overstatement. So we have a small group that's making decisions for people, for women, who are largely not in the room, for people of color who are largely not in the room. And I think one of the reasons we're all here today and why WCAPS is one of the sponsors is we recognize we're not having the right conversations.
So whether we bring in other issues that people are concerned about securitizing, it's my view, having done counterterrorism, that food security is a security issue, that we can have a security aspect of it, but not make it the over uh framework for discussing it, that we can walk and chew gum. These issues are complex. They are part of national security. So I, I think we'll have a spirited <laughs> discussion on that, because I think they should be included. But that we need a far broader definition. And we get the definition because we have a far broader group of people in the room. The reality is, we've been doing this for over 30 years. Are we more secure? I would argue no. I'd say we haven't done it right yet, and we can do it better if we have a full and robust discussion and people informing it, and I'll hold it there for the discussion. But actually, let me follow up with one okay. thing. Thank you for that, and uh, very useful and provocative and clear thoughts. Uh, but I want to ask you to say a little more about what you would define as a national security issue. What for you is the, you know, the, the core uh, the core meaning of that term, because I'm wondering if you agree with me that a national security threat or concern is something that could affect the nation as a whole or a large part of it, mm -hmm. whereas the human security is about the individual or the smaller group and whether there's a useful distinction in keeping our semantics clear and distinguishing between those two. So I guess I have two questions. One, do you, do you agree with me that, that it's useful to to actually have two separate things we're talking about here, national security on the one hand, human security on the other, with a, with a distinction between them. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, to the extent you, you use this national security term, what's an example of you know, a, a new threat or a broader threat or one that's often neglected that should be considered national security but often has not been? For, for example, on your food question, mm -hmm. why should, when and why should that be thought of as a national security threat to a nation as a whole? Right. For your first question about human security, national security, semantics from my perspective, I think human security is national security. And when you made that wonderful example of how many people are killed by homicide, is that a small group of our nation or is that a big group? That's, that's the entire nation. We are all touched by that, made insecure by that fact. So I don't believe I'm going to make a distinction that way. There may be categories to discuss it. There may be a reason to make that distinction. And really, when it comes down to it, it's about focus, it's about attention, and it's about money, mm -hmm. resources to do something with these issues. So however we get that attention, that focus, that money, I'm, I'm in support of that. So <laughs> I'm very flexible on that definition. How do we get attention to deal with that? How do we get people focused on that? On the second part of your question, something that should be part of, that is not traditionally part of national security. Again, looking at 30 years, military, economics, economics, military. That's always there. It's always front and center. I do believe food security should be part of it. Mm -hmm. I know that within this nation, we have large swaths of our population, rural and urban, who are food insecure. That has an impact on education. I think education policy should be part of national security because when you leave huge swaths of our population behind, they are not going to be contributing adults. They're not going to be able to keep this nation safe in that broader definition of the word safe. So I think education be, should be part of it as well as food security and there are any number of things I think we should be looking at as national security issues. Not that they have to be securitized, but they are important to our security and the attention, the focus, and the money that we traditionally give to national security issues need to be given to those issues as well. That's a great answer. Let me, ask, let me add one more thought and then go to Sanam. Um, I may overall have a slightly theoretical preference for a more narrow definition than you, mm -hmm. but I, I wanna back you up with one example, which is that in the 2016 election in the United States, mm -hmm. what we saw is that the anxiety of the middle class fundamentally threatened uh, America's role in the world. And this, I don't mean this as an anti-Trump tirade, no. because I'm actually gonna point out that both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders ran on platforms that did not accept the traditional definition of America's role in the world, and they got a lot of votes. And candidate Trump was much more extreme in his foreign policy than President Trump has been so far, because candidate Trump mm -hmm. was willing to pull back from the world in general. President Trump is doing a lot of things I don't agree with, but he hasn't actually disbanded and dismantled alliances yet and pulled out of most major organizations. Candidate Trump, this is not a defense of Donald Trump, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm observing that in the 2016 election, the anxiety of the American middle class 
was extreme enough that they were prepared as a group to vote for a candidate who didn't really care about traditional American foreign policy commitments around the world, which meant that that election, in a sense, redefined and challenged our definition and our ability to carry out national security the way we had. So whether President Trump winds up being as disruptive as candidate Trump on the foreign policy scene, I don't yet know. But he, got, he won the election saying that he was willing to upend the entire global order. And that, I think, backs up your point. And okay. Bernie Thank Sanders you. had some similar <laughs> themes. Yeah. So uh, over to no. you, Sanam. Thank you for the indulgence on letting me Thank opine. you. No, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I agree with much of what, what's been said already. But, and, and what I'm struck by is a couple of things. That why does the conversation have to be either or? You know, it's either human security or national security. I mean, it's complex. It, we are living in a very complex uh, world right now. We have, we're living in a state of extreme pluralism, which nobody talks about, meaning that you know, just in this room, look at us. We have multiple identities. I could talk to you about US national security or foreign policy as an Iranian, as a at the receiving end of the policies since the 1950s. And I can tell you every single mistake that's been made that's gotten us to the point right now where we may be facing yet another conflict in the Middle East, which is absurd, right? So, so I'm sitting here and I can give you that perspective. I can give you the European perspective because I'm also a British citizen and I'm now seeing how it's working out in the, US, in, in, in the UK and in Europe. And I can sit here as somebody who's lived in the US for the last 16 years, peering into this world and, and seeing what Heather says, which is that we went to the Security Council in 2000. We got a Security Council resolution that for the first time in the history of humanity, or the history of the UN anyway, certainly in the history of humanity as well, actually recognized that women have a role and an agency and a, and a place in the context of peace and security. And that agenda, as it came down the Amtrak sort of northeast corridor <laughs> to Washington, the word peace got thrown out. And literally, I, mean, I was like in Philadelphia, or was it Delaware? I'm not sure. <laughs> But it became about pe about security, security. And, it, and it became, and what I've seen over the last, since I've lived here since just after 9-11, is that it's almost like we're in a, it's, it's, it, it's sometimes I feel as if it's like the US became the Incredible Hulk around the world. All, it's just all the trauma of 9-11 is still being played out mm -hmm. in the rest of the world. And all we can think about is that we are insecure and, and everybody else is a threat to us. We're not insecure. What are we insecure about? It's the biggest economy, it's the biggest military, it has presence everywhere, it has expanded its presence everywhere. And, and by doing some of these things and by being engaged in, in so many of the wars that we see, it's actually becoming more and more hated around the world, right? That, so our own actions are creating huge problems. If I take you back to, to, to Iran of the night, my father's generation and my own generation, what my parents' generation thought about the US was this was a country you came for your education, it was the best universities, public universities. Just, I mean, we've forgotten that public universities educated vast majorities of people in this country, right? Um, that, were not in, that were not expensive. But it was the, the best parts of the US, you know, whether it's, it's the, the um, issues around uh, protecting the environment, having, having sort of a sense of human rights and so forth, all of that has just gotten lost. And we, we are defining everything. If I, I work a lot on the CVE agenda, the countering violent extremism agenda. And my, quest, my, my question to every audience or every space I've been in over the last five, six, seven years of this stuff is, OK, we're countering violent extremism. We're countering terrorism. We're preventing. Now we're saying we're talking about prevention of extremism. What are we for? Have we actually decided what we are for in the world? What are we for? It's, it's a big question. So this has to define it. And I just want to put a couple of other things on the table. Please. Um, we've talked a lot about who's at the table and who's not at the table, and they should be. I'm actually more worried about the fact that it doesn't matter who's at the table, whose money is driving this. We've just seen three billionaires are driving US for foreign policy, certainly around the Middle East right now. Right? So the domestic, we can't separate what's happening domestically from what our foreign policy or security, national security policy is because we have vested interests in this country that are driving it with vast sums of money. And then you layer that with vast sums of money coming from certain governments around the world who are also shaping US national security, national foreign, that they're influencing it. We, we don't have an objective body anymore that is, that is actually saying what is good for the US and what is good for, and how do we want the US to be in the world, and then de defining it based on that. 
where the money is actually driving much of the agenda around, certainly from my region. So, so I, th I think we have to, if we want to redefine, it's not just about who's at the table, but actually shedding light on where the money is coming from and how that money is influencing so much of the thinking that goes on. So let me thank you for also focusing the conversation on U.S. foreign policy. And here we are in 2018, and we all talk enough about President Trump probably for our taste at times. So let me actually look back on the two previous presidents. They were very different from each other. And it's now getting to be a while since President Obama has been in the White House. He talked on the campaign trail about doing a lot of the kind of things that it sounds like you favor. So can you please put these last 16 years or 18 years in some perspective? I mean, you painted with a pretty broad brush and it almost sounded like you didn't see a difference over the 18 years between Bush, Obama, and Trump. Is that a fair way to interpret well, what you're saying? Because, and, and the other way I would, I would want to press you a little, uh, and maybe after you re respond, uh, Gina and Heather could as well, is that even though there's a long ways to go in the world and a lot of problems are getting worse, there are a lot of things that are getting better too. For example, our colleague Homi Karas has documented that you can say that probably by 2020, half the world will be middle class, and he defines it in a certain economist way. And this is an unprecedented number. In the, in the 1940s, it was 10% of the world that had that kind of standard of living or better. And in, whether it's child survival rates, whether it's life expectancy in general, whether it's maternal survival rates, whether it's education levels around the world, uh, whether it's number of people living in democracies, uh, even though that's plateaued in recent years, there has been huge progress in our lifetimes. So I guess I also want to ask and press you a little bit, because your indictment was fairly sweeping, uh, to first of all tell us, didn't anything get better in the Obama years from your perspective, for example? And then secondly, aren't we making at least some headway? And aren't, aren't you really making a call to arms that we build on the progress rather than have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater of previous foreign policy priorities? Uh, uh, so Obama, Bush, uh, yes and no, right? So yes, Obama was great on climate. Um, he did the JCPOA, uh, Cuba, but he also did Yemen. We didn't need to go to war. I mean, the, how do we, why did we end up enabling the Yemen war and fueling it? I mean, just, just, I mean, we have to own it. We have to own Libya. The Libya process, I was, I was working at the UN when, when, the, when the, 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 the decision was made at the Security Council to go into Libya with, with, uh, with NATO. Um, and it was a pretty heavy evening because it was like, okay, so what happens next? What are we, you know, and, and if you look at the playthrough, bombings, Gaddafi is gone, but did we actually learn from the Iraq mistake in terms of what we did with Libya afterwards? It, it was a vacuum. We just, we created a vacuum and, and all the Salafis and all the sort of extremist groups fell in. Um, a lot of people complain ab uh, about the Obama-Syria policy. I actually think that it was, it, it, was, it, it was the most complex problem that we've dealt with you know, in generations because it's so many different wars being played out. But I have Syrian colleagues who back in 2011 were saying to us, we're not getting uh, resources for education. Education is not part of the humanitarian package. And we can tell you in the next four months, the Saudis are coming in, they're bringing their books, they're, they're bringing their money, the Saudis and the Qataris, are, we're gonna see 60% of this population going extremist because that's where the money is coming from for, for, for food and education and, and, and so forth. So, it's, it's, so yes, we've, there's been, there was some progress, but there has to be a mirror where we can look at ourselves. And here I'm putting my American hat on and say, you know, some of this stuff, we're just, we just keep making the same mistakes. And the question is, is it because the same people are sitting around the table benefiting, there are vested interests in these games, right? The, the contractors and so forth, and, and creating the same problems over and over again. These, these are, I mean, it's complex. There's some good, there's some bad. And, and, I, and I'll end with this on a, on a more sort of positive note, if you want. Honestly, I think that the world wants the U.S. to be the good that it can be. Right? Everybody's looking for that. They're not, people don't want to be Russia and China. They really want the U.S. To be, to be good. But we've reached a point where it's like, oh my God, what are the Americans doing? Everywhere I go, people say this. And, and I'll just add this. Um, it is remarkable to, be, uh, to walk around the world with my skin color and speaking whatever languages I speak and having an Allah around my neck because um, I get to talk to people in a different way. And what they'll tell me are things that you may never hear. 
Right, and and I get to talk to all sorts of people. I get I, can, I, I, I get to hear them too. Exactly, we <laughs> we get to yeah, that's right. Exactly, funny thing, right? We we get to speak to women in Afghanistan and men. Yeah. I get to I get to sit with a group of men and have a very serious conversation about security and the peace, whatever it is, and and so forth. And I get to sit with the women. Um, I, and I think that this is the, why you need a diversity of people in these spaces, in in our foreign policy spaces, is because. Actually, when whatever region we're dealing with, whatever issue we're dealing with in this country, you can have the dream team. You're working with on West Africa. You can have some of the best brains on West Africa in the in the in the rooms where the decisions are being made. You're working on the Middle East. Get all the Middle Eastern experts, not just of one one side or the other. Get everybody if we're thinking about what's best for the U.S. But there's the tendency to keep excluding. Um, and excluding and excluding, and, and it becomes limited to certain people. Thank you. So, Gene, I want to ask you to comment on whatever you'd like to say at this point. And <laughs> whether you want to pick up the uh, challenge to U.S. foreign policy or not is your call, but um, also the broader question about have we made some progress in, in redefining national security and in improving national and human security, some of the statistics I quoted and some others, or are we still sort of stuck at, you know, ground zero hmm. or the well, first four? Seventeen thoughts went through my head while Sana was speaking. <laughs> I, would, I would think so. Um, so I'll, I'll go first to a quote from Walter Lippmann that was made in 1988, 30 years ago, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it firmly in my head, but basically he said, every year a group of men get together and define national security and how to enhance it and address it, and every year make more or less the same decisions and the same mistakes. And that was 1988, so 30 years ago. You belong to a sister think tank as well. Um, you know, I believe we don't have the right people in the room. I've, I've been in the room from time to time, and we don't have the right people in the room. The experts, a thin swath of experts are in the room, but not people who have ground knowledge. And the fact is that these decisions have an impact on Everybody, women and children, and that's why more women need to be at tables for the peace, not just the security. And, and the as security. you talked about, yes, and, and both. And when you talked about sitting in a room with men and having a discussion about peace and security, you have a discussion with women in the room about peace and security because it has an impact on them. It has an impact on all of us. Have we done anything better? You mentioned Yemen, and that is very painful because you're absolutely right. We should not have, but there we are. I'm looking at Africa, and are we taking the lessons and the habits that we have developed of our Middle East machinations, and now are we taking them to Africa now? So we've lost soldiers in Niger. We're in Mali. Are we making ourselves more secure by taking a military presence to Africa? Are we indeed, as some argue, making more people hate us, making more terrorists who are focusing on us? And we need a really frank discussion and raw recognition of this and change what we're doing as a result, because I think the answers are pretty clear. The answers are pretty clear. I have more, but I'll So, Heather, uh, I'm sure you've got some things to add. I, and I'm not going to really be up here to defend my gender, but I am going to say one thing by way of provocation, <laughs> which is that even though I agree that there aren't enough women and enough women of color in important decisions and conversations in the United States, in our lifetime, there's been a lot of progress. I mean, most you recent... stole my line. OK, OK. <laughs> I, I, won't, I, I, won't, I, I won't say any further. Over to you. <laughs> well, I literally was just sitting up here thinking that um, when I was born, um, my mom wanted to join the Foreign Service but couldn't because she also wanted to marry my dad. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my career, um, not only was there nobody who looked like us, um, there also it was the first generation that people with names like O'Hanlon were making their way through. <laughs> um, so the degree to which we have um, democratized how national security policy is made in the US and who is allowed to put their fingers into it, I mean, you're totally right. I used to say, there are a few people here who are old enough. When I was an undergrad, I used to say that my only female role model was Jean Kirkpatrick, and she wasn't really who I wanted to grow up and be. <laughs> and sure enough, everyone young in the room is looking at me totally stone-faced. Uh, go, look, go look her up. 
Um, she's not my politics, but a pioneering figure, uh, somewhat relevant to some of the things we're struggling with today. So, but the other thing that happened was that as um, our policymaking was democratizing in that positive way, that more of the talent that America produces was able to claw its way in the door and fight its way up um, as Gina did. Um, we also were, um, along with that came the rise of the ability of interest groups to play across the board in American policymaking um, and the ability of money to really play in the ways that, that Sanam has referred to. And we, a mistake that we've made in this field for a long time is to assume that we were different in national security. And over the last eight, 10 years, we've gone from the story we all tell ourselves that politics ends at the water's edge, that we're the least politicized. We're now the most politicized part of American policymaking. We're the most polarized. People's views on our issues totally flip-flop based on partisan identity. And that's, that's a reality that we that we have to get used to. I want to say one other quick thing, Mike. Um, you asked for sort of a historical lens. Mm -hmm. And you know, looking, looking way back, the, the truth is the way that Americans were convinced to take up the role in the world that we've played um, since our decision to enter into the Second World War that has had both very positive outcomes and very negative ones around the world um, has always been founded on security fears that we've trained ourselves now over, what is it, three or four generations. Because during the Cold War, we did an enormous, amazing range of things. I mean, we funded literary magazines through the CIA, mm -hmm. and we said that that was a, you know, we had to have literary magazines for our national security. We had to have health programs. We had to fight polio for our national security. We had to fund language education at universities for our, we did an amazing array of non-military things for our national security, and then, after the Cold War ended, we didn't come up with a good reason for why we should keep doing those things. And this is something we struggled with in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Then 9-11 happened. And honestly, ever since then, everyone tries to move back into the military security realm because that's where the money and prestige are. And to your point about, you know, yes, intellectually, your three buckets make an enormous amount of sense. But nobody wants to be in the bucket where there's not any money. <laughs> um, Clear enough. Yeah. So we do have this, I mean, th th it, it's older than all of us in the room, this problem that the way we've raised and trained ourselves as Americans to think about the rest of the world is through, through this lens of fear. Yes. Um, but that's human nature, I think. I read that in National Geographic. That's human <laughs> nature. That's how we stay alive, that we worry about everything. I have a question for both of you, if you don't mind, which is you, you've talked about the import of money and, and special interests, which we're all very well aware of in the last eight, 10 years. But I don't think that's any different than it was 50 years or 100 years or European politics. Those who have the power and the money are those who make the decisions. And what, what difference? Other so, than the fact that we're aware of it now, what difference are you seeing? Well, that, that's, I mean, I don't know the, con the historic context in the U.S. on these things, but, but the fact that it makes the news that three men in the country funded the equivalent of 44% of the Congressional Leadership Fund and 47% of the Senate Leadership Fund, that must be new news. I mean, that's the, the, the extent of it. The is, news, is, not the, the new. That <laughs> right, it's the news, but it's, but it's also, is it, is, it, is, it the, is it just the quant, the sheer, you know, um, did, did it used to be 10% or did it, you know, how, what's the difference over the last 10, 15, 20 years? In Europe, um, to your point, uh, in England just now, mm -hmm. um, one of the Brexit, pro-Brexit groups is being uh, fined because the, the Electoral Commission found that they had spent 70,000 pounds over their limit. Mm -hmm. 70,000. Okay, I mean, that's, that's such a pathetic, so there are tighter, tighter rules, yes. right? So, but I wanted to, to bring, um, I wanted to just kind of this question of human security, national security. To me, it, you know, in my, you asked for the, for the biography piece of this. Back in 1996, I, we, we had our first conference from women around co conflict areas. And there was a South African woman called Tandi Modise who had been in the armed force, armed group of the, of the ANC, and then went on to become the chair of the uh, Joint Defense Select Committee in, in, um, in the parliament. And she told a story about how as they were transitioning from apartheid to democracy, 
uh, they were looking at national security and they were very concerned about the fact that, that the army and the police and all the sort of intelligence forces and stuff in South Africa were, of course, dominated by the apartheid uh, groups. And so they're trying to figure out how to change this. And, um, and through their discussions, they, the, the party picked up the human security framework. They thought that this was an interesting uh, idea. But the vested interests, the, the, you know, the helicopter sellers and the tank sellers and you know, the defense industry, essentially, came to parliament and went, went to the defense ministry and then, and then came to parliament to approve the purchase of heavy duty uh, equipment. And Tandy was the woman who basically turned around and said, wait a second, why do we need all this stuff? Let's go and do a national defense review. And what they did was for three years, they went around the country and they asked people, what does security mean to you? You know, ordinary people, ordinary South Africans in villages and towns and cities and, and, and so forth. And people started saying things like, well, security is clean water. Security is having street lights. Security is, is getting rid of the depleted uranium or dirty, dirty you know, soil because of the military presence. It was through the poverty, uh, HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. So they actually went and, and it was, and I call it democratizing the national security mm -hmm. debate. Let's go ask people. What do they think national security is? And I, and I would be really interested in this country because when you think that the hurricanes that we had l last year have cost something like, and I, and I imagine this is a low estimate, of $300 billion, right? People's lives, ask them what security is. Let's go ask Puerto Ricans what is security when they don't have electricity. For, so I, th I think that we need to open this space up and not make it this kind of techno expert world of these little these few people who know about this stuff no there are some people that you know there is there is uh, there is vested interest there are people who want to keep it to themselves but actually it should be democratized and we should have a wider conversation and i suspect we'll come somewhere in the middle between the you know the hurricane issues and the terrorism or gun violence issues and and it'll all come together in, in, in a more inclusive and more appropriate way than, than what we have right now. And on the Pentagon money, just one thing. I'm a taxpayer. I don't want my money going to the Pentagon. Why should my money go to the Pentagon when it could go to aid or state or wherever it is? You know, let's have that conversation as well because it's, it goes in there and it's a black box that they can't even do an audit. So two things, <laughs> if I may, that take your point and bring it back to, to Gina's question. Um, Something I observe with great distress in my looking at public opinion data is that you're totally right that if you went out and said, what does security mean to you? You would hear, you'd hear a lot about gun violence. You'd hear a lot about opioid addiction. You'd hear a lot about livelihoods. Um, you'd also hear a lot about cultural insecurity and a lot about, I don't like those people not speaking English at my store. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are now um, living in a very divided country along these lines where there are some constructs of security out there that are in some ways even more problematic than, than what, we need we're, to work on what we're currently dealing yeah. with. So that brings me back to Gina's point about the past. And yeah, let's be real, um, like European national security, which actually even more so, American national security has always been and is still is controlled by elites. And what has changed is that there's more contention among elites and that then we use mass politics to, to advantage one set of elites over another. And what's um, marvelous or horrifying about American politics, depending on how you think about it, is that we do have more mass play with our contending elites. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think some of the more um, extreme displays of, I mean, sort of cartoonish displays yes. like, like the one you're talking about, um, so that in a funny way, we've democratized our elites just enough that they can fight with each other visibly in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Very rich and fascinating discussion. Now I want to go to all of you. And uh, we took a little more time. I allowed this to go on a little longer because it was so interesting. But we only have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So what I want to do is take a few questions together. And we're going to sort of do one larger round. And then we'll just go down the row and ask each of our panelists to respond to those couple of questions most interesting uh, to you or most directed to you by way of also closing comments. And then we'll swap out seamlessly without a coffee break. Uh, and I'll hand off to Tamara <laughs> at about 11.15 or 11.20. So why don't I begin here in the second row and then the fourth row. Please wait for a microphone. I think we have them. Uh, you know, we'll start up here in the front. And we're, again, we're going to take a few all together. So all the way up here in the second row, please, to start. And if you have a question, you want, if you want to direct it to one person, that's preferred, but as you wish. Hi. Um, uh, my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, 
true. Hi. Um, my question could be for any one of you, if any one of you want to take it. Um, I totally agree um, that there is so, such a wide range of things that should be incorporated in the national security agenda, but I guess my question is, um, what would be the bounds of an agenda? Like, what shouldn't be incorporated in it? Should there even be limits to a national security agenda? Because I feel like I could convince myself that so many things and so many sectors should be incorporated in it, but is there a point at which the lines are bleeding a little bit too much? Or, because, you know, like, it could go from poverty to education to climate change, which it starts to go into so many different fields. So should there be limits? And if those there are limits, what would those limits be? And I should have asked you to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm Lalitha Ramaswamy. I'm a development consultant. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. And then here in the fourth row, please take notes on which questions you want to respond to. We'll do that at the end. My name is Bumi Akinasotu. I am the Chief of Staff of the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. That's who pays me. And then on the side, I am the creator and producer of What in the World podcast, which attempts to make foreign policy democratized, understandable for regular people outside of the Beltway. And all of my guests are women and people of color. So, yes. Uh, so my question is, is very simple. Um, I'm noticing that a lot of cities have taken on foreign policy, national security conversations and policies. You see it happening in New York. Um, so I'm wondering if you're speaking to city local leaders here in the United States, what would you, or sort of what role do you see them playing in national security conversations in the future? Um, and do you see this as sort of like a moment in time where after 2020, maybe things sway back up to the federal level and there's some sense of normalcy? Or do you feel like this is the way forward where now cities are getting involved in international engagements with, with other cities abroad or other countries abroad? Super. And we'll go to the sixth row and then over here after that. So we'll stay on this side. Yes, yes, please. And then, and then to the woman over here on the, by the aisle. Hi, I'm Ilana Aquino. I'm actually the vice chair of the board of WCAPS. Um, I am so pleased to see this event happening, as I know the many conversations that will ripple out from this are really the seed of causing change. My question is, how do we begin to impact um, redefining national security, having the right people be in the room, having resources directed towards issues that we really believe will make the difference. How do we begin to impact that in tangible ways? Um, and more specifically, what is the work that you would recommend the people in this room um, go out and begin to do as we re-enter our spheres of influence? Thank you. And then we'll go over here. Uh, you pass the microphone just two rows up, please. Thank you. My name is Erin Dempsey. I work for a crisis communications consulting firm. So we work for a varied group of Fortune 500 companies who are interested in national security issues. So my question would be, what industries do you think need to kind of reevaluate their role in the conversation, who may not already be thinking about how they play or how they have an impact on national security? Great. Let's take one or two more, and then we'll have to wrap up here. So uh, I'll be a little bit democratic in terms of what part of the room I'm calling on. So, so there's a, a woman in about the 10th row, and then a gentleman here in about the 7th row, and then we'll, I think, have to wrap up and go back to the panel. So uh, over on this side, woman in the red shirt and, I think, blue jacket and the 10th. Yeah, right, right there. Please. Hi. Um, I'm a retired. Cl closer to your mouth, please. Can't hear you. Yeah. Um, my name is Dina Lasso. I'm a retired lawyer. I've done a lot of work on women's rights in the U.S. I am not at all part of your foreign policy world. And I have what may be a dumb question, but something I've always wor wondered about. You mentioned all the schools that the Saudis fund. I've never been aware. Saudi Arabia is supposedly a friend of the United States. Why is that? doesn't that seem to be an issue that the U.S. has ever tried to do anything about? We have. Okay, and then gentleman here in the, yes. Thank you. Um, Daniel Stoll, I'm with uh, Georgetown University, and I think my question maybe is for Gina. Uh, when we talk about getting diverse voices at the table and in the room, I'm not hearing actually a lot of conversation about a disciplinary variety. How many of us in this room have studied politics, international affairs, law, military? But I think what you're talking about are hydrologists, agronomists, uh, social scientists, anthropologists. So how do we get those voices in the room along with 
those of us who have done uh, law and international affairs. Super. Thank you for excellent questions. So now I'm going to invite our panelists to each take maybe about just three or at most four minutes so we stay on schedule to respond to whichever couple of questions most speak to you or were directed at you, and then combine that with your any you know, final concluding thoughts. And Heather, could we start again with you, please? Sure. Um, the city's question I'll take, because I have a very brief answer to it, um, that, that power is not going back in the box. Cities are going to continue to be key actors. Many of the challenges we've been talking about, whatever box you put them in, are going to have to be addressed at subnational levels. And um, like many other things about this moment that we're in, the idea that 2021 comes and they flip back is just completely misbegotten. So thanks for, answer, for asking that. Um, LA is another city I would watch. They've got a really phenomenal deputy mayor who's a colleague of ours. Um, um, and then um, the question of are there limits to the national security agenda? Should there be? I loved that question. I would answer it in a two-part way. Um, that we have a whole range of challenges which we're all identifying which are not being adequately responded to and which a country as wealthy and diverse and talented as ours is really should be able to respond to. So the first, the first challenge is how do you, is identifying as a society what are our challenges and how we meet them. And then within that, there's a certain subset of challenges that security institutions are positioned to meet. And, you know, honestly, I don't want the Pentagon doing development assistance. I don't want the Pentagon doing education. Um, I don't want the Pentagon doing, um, I mean, honestly, health research. But the Pentagon does all those things quite well because people are willing to put money there. So in the long run, in my platonic design of US society, um, national security is a narrow set of things that national security institutions do well. But that requires a massive political change such that we're willing to put resources and talent into other institutions. Um, last point for me, I'm guessing all of us are going to want to answer the how do you impact question. Um, I mean, the most important answer to that is you go out and do things that you do well and love to do. Um, there's no box that you should be trying to fit yourself in, um, which is something that many of us may have believed at various points in, in our careers. Um, Second, you do what you do well with an insistence that what you're doing is part of the security conversation. Um, and that's one that takes a little intestinal fortitude sometimes. Um, and last point is you think about what are the sources of power in this country or globally for the thing you want to do. And you don't get sucked into doing work in a way that's cut off from what is the power that can make that work happen. And again, that doesn't mean everybody has to go be a community activist. Um, everybody shouldn't be a community activist. Some people should stay right here in the think tank. Um, but <laughs> but I, Don't take that person. I meant that in a good way. I meant that in a good way. <laughs> But there's really no excuse for doing your work without, without a power analysis and without a theory about how, who's out there that you need to be partnering with in order for your work to produce change. It's a great answer. Thank you. Gina. Um, on the question about discipline variety to the room on these discussions, I, I think it's very important. The bottom line for me is, are people bringing different experiences, different backgrounds to the discussion? And if that's part of those, that different experience, then a lot of this, as we all know, as we sit in this room, is self-selecting. Is someone who is interested in art history going to want to weigh in on this topic? So it, it may be putting a call out, making sure that people understand that they're welcome, that they're interested, that we want their opinions and their views. And a lot of it is going to be self-selecting. On the Saudi schools, since I spent three years in Saudi having discussions about those schools and Saudi education and who are they funding, et cetera, our challenge is, of course, that we are this country that says any kind of speech is free speech. We generally stand by that still. And therefore, to put um, limits on that is not something that we can legally do or that we're culturally comfortable doing. So we did have, and I'm sure continue to have, discussions with the Saudi government about what's in the books. Um, it, it hates speech, although we use nicer words than that, but that's what we meant, and they knew that's what we meant. Um, 
that they needed to address, and they certainly said that was not their intent, but it is a very conservative interpretation of Islam. Many things are not acceptable, and many things are thought to be not good, and that's part of the education, and if they're funding a school, then it is their right in this country to say it and to have it shaped like that. And until we're ready to step away from that, that's, that's our struggle. So we have the conversations. Don't think we don't. We do continue to have them. Um, and getting diversity in the room. You know, it's certainly better now. I, I sit here in some sorrow and had a, an earlier conversation with Heather. When I left the Department of State, it was my intent to leave a phalanx of people of color behind me because I know that America needs representatives that look like America and that we will do our jobs better when we have a wide variety of experiences brought to bear to solve problems. So all of you, anybody not in the Foreign Service, this room looks great. Please think about it because I must be replaced. People like us must be replaced. And if you saw the photograph with the new secretary, it does not look good right now. It does not look good. So please think about it. Tell other people, we must be replaced. Those of you who are at state, stay. <laughs> stay. So you have to be there to add variety to the room. And you have to recognize that one or two is not enough, that we must help each other. Allies must help us. Because in the end, it's better for all of us. I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you. And Sana, I'm over thank to you. Thank you. On the discipline issue, thank you. I'm an anthropologist and a lit major. So I, I, I'm, I, yeah. I, struggle, I have struggled over the years to see what, what's the common language. But, but, it's, but I think we, what we need is actually uh, students that are trained multi, in multidiscipline perspectives. That's what we need, because that's the world out there. On the Saudi question, I think one of the problems is that the Saudis and the Qataris also fund a lot of think tanks and universities and places where analysis is done, and media experts, and so forth. So it's not just that they're, they're in the schools, they are everywhere. We don't, we, we don't often hear the alternative voices. So, so I think that it's a, it's a bigger problem, and it's been part of their strategies um, out here. Um, on the question of um, where, do, where do we draw the boundaries, I think what's happened over the last, since 9-11, is that humanity has been slowly securitized. All of us are experiencing this and, and all of our, whether it's in our daily lives when you go to the airport or whether it's in the work that we do, it's, and it's because the budget in the Pentagon and it's you know, this, this absolute fear that, that there is. What we need to do is slowly flip it the other way around to humanize security so that we can talk about food and shelter and, and all these other things and put the money, as we've said, put the money in that space also but recognize that if we don't do this, and I, and I think you brought this up at the beginning, if we don't do this and, and we leave a vacuum, if we're not enabling governments to have education and healthcare services for their people, uh, in Nigeria, for example, Boko Haram is now taking that. Um, Hezbollah is not just a militia organization, it also gives healthcare, right? So, so that, that's, the, that's how we need to be thinking. People, ordinary people need basic services, whether it's in this country or elsewhere. And if we're not recognizing economic and social rights or the sustainable development goals, or however you want to, one way you want to frame it, um, somebody else is filling that, and then it becomes a security issue later on. So, so that, that's something. Um, to the companies question that, that was brought up. I mean, obviously, the defense industry is having a ball with, with, uh, with everything that's going on. The tech industry thinks that they can save us, and they actually have, I mean, they're great, but some, some, they're, they're, there's a disconnect between them and a lot of things that are going on. What I would like is to have a serious conversation with the private sector around how they benefit from peace, right? They're taking peace for granted. And peace, we're, the, we're shredding peace around the world. I'd like to be able to talk to the hotel industry and the airline industry and, and everybody else about the fact that they need to begin to invest in peace. And, and it brings me to my final point that I would love to see national security actually become national peace and security. Mm -hmm. Let's put peace back in the frame. So it's not just about security, it's about being able to, to live peaceful lives and value it. And, and what I find with, the, again, looking back, and I, and I, and I don't, I don't want to just be critical, but it is so ex interesting for me that around the world, people have solutions. Women, I work, we have an alliance of women's organizations in 30 countries. They are strategic, they are extremely pragmatic, they're, they are hands you know, rolled up, they're doing all this work. We don't listen to them. We don't listen to you know, the, the, the decades and centuries of solutions that exist for water and this and that, whether it's in Iran or elsewhere. 
We don't, the United States is a young country. It doesn't have all the answers. And yet it's wanting to go out and tell the world what to do when the rest of the world's like, we've been there, done that, seen it. You know, work with us, don't just work at us or on us or against us type, type of a thing. So, so we need to really change that paradigm. Thank you. Fantastic. We're going to swap out now with panel two, and I'm going to give the floor to Tamara. But please join me in thanking this amazing panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.